We have a large and distinguished panel to tell us about what we're learning in these living laboratory projects at uh, Sunbridge. And I'm just going to give you a quick interview. Quick, I'm not going to give you a quick <laughs> interview. I'm going to give an overview. So um, first, Dr. Patrick Bolin on the end Thank you. is a professor of biology at the University of Central <laughs> Florida. Uh, many of you, I'm not sure what's going on. With this. I'm going to come over here. Uh, many of you heard from Dr. Bolin yesterday at the um, research plots at base camp. Uh, his research focuses on urban ecology and biodiversity. He has served as a research biologist at Archbold Biological Station and as a director of landscape and natural resources and the Arboretum at UCF. He holds a PhD in entomology from The Ohio State University. <laughs> I had to add the in there. Yeah, you had yeah. to do that. <laughs> Brooke Moffis is a commercial horticulture agent at UF IFAS Extension Lake County. Her background includes experience at Quartz Arboretum. Is that Quartz? Quartz. Quartz, yeah. Uh, Post Properties and the Walt Disney World Company, allowing her to bridge the gap between research and practical landscape application. Brooke holds a bachelor's degree in horticulture, a master's degree in entomology, and is currently pursuing her PhD, which she will have very soon, working with Dr. Basil Iannone. Victoria Cope is an MS student at the University of Florida in the School of Forest, Fisheries, and Geomatic Sciences. Her research aims to quantify resources available to higher trophic levels in landscapes using native plants in comparison to conventional landscapes. Her scope of research includes urban ecology, arthropod food webs, native plants, and conservation. And she is a big thinker with a lot of amazing ideas that she's already brought to the table. So excited to hear from you as well. Michaela Hageman is a graduate researcher at the University of Central Florida. She's currently working with the Sunbridge Development to study how incorporating native plants into suburban landscapes uh, can benefit pollinator communities. So she gets to do the fun, pretty work. Talk about butterflies and bees. Michaela received her undergraduate degree in wildlife ecology from the University of Maine, and she is obtaining her master's degree at UCF. Dr. Nick Taylor works with the Program for Resource Efficient Communities. We've worked together for almost 18 years now um, at the Center for Land Use Efficiency and he's an IFAS uh, state specialized extension agent. He analyzes water utility data and energy utility data to effectively identify conservation measures and evaluation of land development impacts. Dr. Taylor leads the H2O Save Extension Program, which stands for Water, water Savings Analytics and Verification. And finally, on the end, uh, Dr. Del Botcher, uh, who's also a PE, He's the president of Soil and Water Engineering Technology, Inc., a consulting firm uh, focused on water resource engineering in the areas of environmental assessment and management for watersheds, urban and agricultural water management control and BMP development, hydrological chemical transport processes, water quality monitoring, and water structure design and assessment. And he's helping us transform these living laboratories and integrate with the watershed assessment model that's been used all around the state for years to better track our TMDLs and water quality issues. So with that, I'm going to hand the, well, I'm not going to hand the mic. You've got the, the mic. mic. My face, yeah. I'm going to turn the mic <laughs> off and hand it over to Patrick. All right. Thank you, Jenison. Thank you. Thank you, Jenison. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming today and for yesterday. Uh, very impressed that 170 of you made it out in the rain to visit the research plots and the homes yesterday. That was really remarkable. I uh, do want to thank Jenison. There's a couple of key people who uh, make sure that the uh, cats in, uh, that are part of this project are herded well. Jenison for, for the uh, UF crowd and the, and the academics, and Carolyn for Cherry Lake uh, have to do so much to make these things run smoothly, so I want to acknowledge them for that. Um, you asked, there was a question about what is new, and, and fortunately on the research uh, front, we do have some new things. Uh, we also have some things that we'll reiterate from last year that are very similar, but we have uh, made some uh, new progressions, and there's new people sitting up here on the stage that reflect that. Um, 
The outside collab, uh, most of you are very familiar with, so I, I don't think I need to explain it to you, but from the research perspective, um, uh, it's, it's the, cl the collab is really the central feature of what makes this thing run. And we talk about research collaboration, uh, typically that is researchers working together from di different disciplines. It might be some researchers from different disciplines working maybe with a community partner, but the outside collab is bigger than that. And in my experience in life, I've been involved with one other big collab like this when I was in South Florida. Real collabs involve not just people across uh, disciplines or silos within a, within a group, like an academic institution, but they involve multiple groups that are in different silos and together make a much bigger group that breaks down some of those walls between the silos. And it's those kinds of collabs that make the kinds of innovative things that outside is accomplished happen. You have to have partners representing all of the interested parties. And so this, this particular collab, and um, Pierce referred to all these, but from a research perspective, you know, we have the UF, UCF uh, interaction with the groups up there. Then we have the developer, Sunbridge, who's actually funded a uh, graduate student, funded Michaela. They also funded the establishment of the research plots and are supporting and providing a lot of logistical support. Cherry Lake uh, helped plant the plots, is doing the maintenance while well, they planted the plots, uh, do all the maintenance, track the irrigation, and uh, really have supported the research, um, and even Green Isle Gardens, you know, plant material. Um, Nature Conservancy is funding Victoria and her work. So uh, we have another funder of another graduate student who's a key partner. And then you have Life Soils, you have industry players with Cherry Lake and Life Soils that are the people who actually work in the industry uh, and, uh, and uh, have contributed tremendously both in terms of the material and time resources that they've committed to the project. So yes, it's a research, we've done collaborative research, but it's, it's, it's beyond what most people think is collaborative research. It feeds into the collab. And when you're in a collab like this, you have to think about what are the needs and and, and outcomes that all of the different partners are looking for. And that leads to different kinds of research objectives as well. So I won't go over this too much. What I did want to say is we do have our plot experiment that you visited yesterday. Uh, and, and Brooke's going to talk about the native plants and the soils. Uh, Michaela's going to talk about the pollinators and some of the other invertebrate work we're doing. And then um, Victoria's going to talk about the uh, food web work she's been doing comparing neighborhoods. Um, and part of this also, we're going to cover um, the water consumption involved and the, and the maintenance requirements that are also being tracked. Now, the neighborhood scale research is new this year, where we're actually comparing neighborhoods. Uh, this is a shot from uh, Dell's presentation, but we're comparing the Dell Webb neighborhood to the model homes in Westland Park. So that's new. We're doing the same kind of ecological comparisons. That's what Victoria's doing. We're looking at water consumption. Nick's going to talk about the irrigation. And then Dell is getting into this water quality monitoring uh, modeling that he's going to talk about as our last speaker in the research group this morning. You saw and know about the boundary experiment. Brooke is going to go into this in a little more depth, so I won't go into it, but we've got our compost and irrigation treatments. That's where we started with research. That was our big thing. Researchers come down and do this. That led to this bigger question of, well, how do we apply that to the actual neighborhoods that are being built down there? And what we envisioned early on, and then these, things, these ideas snowballed, just like the outside collab has snowballed, um, to do uh, a comparison of the neighborhoods. This base camp project has really only been going since January 22. That's what it looked like when we planted it. If you saw it yesterday, it looked something like that. It filled in very quickly. But the new thing that we added was comparing these two neighborhoods. Um, Westland Park is where you visited. The base camp's over here. But the Del Webb 55 plus community across the road it has very traditional landscapes. Very minimal plant palette, lots of St. Augustine's turf, and all of their properties are managed by the management company. So we can get all the data on water use and, and all the other things that are going on in these yards because there's one management entity. It's the same in the model homes for our model homes are being married, uh, managed by Cherry Lake. So we can make really good comparisons about what it takes to keep those landscapes going. And then our researchers here, Michaela, in addition to doing the work on pollinators in the, uh, in the plots that she'll talk about, is working. And we did compare the model homes to these homes. There's the model home. There's these homes. And then Victoria is doing the comparison also in those neighborhoods. Nick is going to talk about water consumption uh, and irrigation. And Dell has actually done some work where he started to model the impacts of the developments on water quality 
which is the downstream side, does how we manage the landscape affect what ends up in terms of nutrients in our waterways and runoff and those kinds of things? So he's just started. That's a new effort as part of this project. Um, looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, and the whole idea goes back to you know, uh, Pierce's group's ideas about developing benchmarks for how do, we, how do we create benchmarks for sustainable landscapes. And I think there are things people are familiar with. We want more native plants, less use of pesticide and fertilizers. We want more biodiversity, and there's lots of ways to measure that. One of the reasons we focused on insects early on is because they're new landscapes. You know, birds are a very important uh, wildlife in urban areas, in residential areas, but we didn't have the developed landscapes where we have a lot of birds. So this is what we chose to do, but the overall goal is to try to have richer, more abundant uh, wildlife and uh, biodiversity. And then we all know that we want to try to reduce this, our water consumption, and then improve the impacts of our developments downstream. So that's kind of all of our research feeds into various uh, aspects of this, uh, these benchmarks. So with that, I think we're going to pass the pointer to Brooke, who's going to tell us about her work. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. So I'm excited to be here with you again this year. All right, so I'm going to be diving into the boundary planting at base camp and the native plants and urban soils. And I work for UF IFAS Extension in Lake County and I'm a PhD student. So I'm the commercial horticulture agent, and I am um, also the Florida-friendly landscaping agent in Lake County. And what am I doing wrong, Patrick? Down, down goes the other one. Oh, oh, hang on. Okay, I'll get with the program eventually. All right, so I wanted to first go into what the development process looks like. Uh, when we first uh, start to develop a, a land, land, we actually go in and we remove all existing vegetation. We put it into big piles, and then we burn it. And then we grade the land. And then we grade the land again. And sometimes the soils are from, you know, 8 feet, 20 feet below where we dug out a retention pond or, or you know, graded the land for water drainage. And then that's what's placed on the site where the buildings are going to be built. So then we build the homes and we come along and we place turf grass on, there, on this really, really degraded soil conditions, very compacted conditions. And then we give the, the token foundation plants, right? The little line of shrubs right in front of the house. And then we usually have a standard shade tree. And then it gets turned over to the property management company. Uh, eventually it gets turned over to the HOA or the homeowner. And then they're stuck trying to grow a successful landscape in these types of degraded conditions. And so with our urban soils, uh, they our, our soils in general actually are 50% mineral and 50% pore space. The pore space can either be filled by water or it can be filled by air. So when we have this soil compaction, that pore space is squeezed out. And when that happens, the roots simply cannot grow into the soil. They just can't physically do it once we reach a certain threshold. And you'll get stunted plants, plants that are never really healthy. So the conditions are poor drainage and aeration, reduced root penetration. And then we can also get really high pHs on these disturbed soils, which you know, cause greater stress to the plant and then we get low biological activity too. So this soil is very, very sterile. This is actually a picture of me on my soil probe with my full body weight on it, trying to get that probe in about six inches and I just couldn't do it. That's how compacted it was. So, uh, and this was after the second grading, I believe, right before we were starting to plant these plots. So that what I'm measuring is um, measuring visual quality, which you all helped me do yesterday, those of you that were in attendance. I'm looking at soil quality, so I'm looking at the density of the soil. I'm also looking at the carbon and nitrogen ratio. I'm looking at nutrients and then water holding capacity. And then I'm also looking at pest and disease presence, herbivory, so I'm actually measuring the amount of holes or at least attempting to measure the amount of holes that are being made in leaves so we can see how productive this is ecologically. And then I'm looking at plant survivorship. So how many of these plants are going to survive? What species are going to survive? And then we're also looking at coverage and growth rate, which we are attempting to capture with a drone. But again, our treatments, I think I really pushed this home to the folks that were in my group yesterday touring the plots. We had as needed irrigation, and then we had regular irrigation. Our as needed irrigation was just when we saw signs of plant wilting, and our regular irrigation was weekly. And then we had two treatments, which was compost and without compost. So our treatments were water as, like I said, water as needed, which is when we saw signs of wilting and the uh, watering weekly. I had a lot of questions actually yesterday on the tour, like what does the irrigation look like? Is it all drip? Like how is it, 
you know, how's it configured? And so these pictures really help you to see that here where we laid out the irrigation. And when we laid out the irrigation, it was actually during planting. So the plants were planted and then we put the irrigation out in most of the plots. Although I think some plots may have had irrigation laid out and then some of the plants popped in. So it was laid out, uh, the irrigation was laid out during the planting process. And then the compost amendments, I had a lot of questions on this. We put down four cubic yards per thousand square foot. And when I say we, that's live soils, put down four cubic yards per thousand. I didn't do this, fortunately. I've tilled a lot of landscapes and I'm, I'm glad it wasn't me. But um, so live soils uh, came in and did that for us. So four cubic yards per thousand square foot. And they tilled it into about the top four inches of the soil. So you can see how that looked. And then we tilled all plots because we wanted to make sure that if we saw any difference in the plants, that we were seeing difference due to the compost and not just the tilling. So we have a project plant list and we went with lots of different forms of native plants. So, and when I say forms, I mean we had trees, small trees, we had shrubs, grasses, we had some legumes, we had wildflowers, ground covers. So we wanted to try to kind of cover the whole plant form gamut. And then we also picked a lot of native plants like Gulf Mealy grass, which is very, very commonly grown in the landscape already. And Ilex vomitoria, uh, the Yopon holly. But then we picked some ones that really aren't seen a lot in the industry like button rattlesnake master and mist flower. So, and we wanted to see again, how these plants were gonna perform over time in these urban soils. All right, so you all, most of you experienced the visual quality rating system. Um, you know, I joked around and said it's a really high tech system, but actually we do do this in the industry. The nursery industry uses this to rate plants when they do research, and the turf industry uses a similar system to rate turf grass plots when they do their research. So again, one was the plant was dead, it's still intact, I can find it out in the plots, but it's deader than a doornail. Um, 10 is excellent quality, and then five is an important metric because that is where the when the plant is marketable when we could sell that plant anything below five i don't think most homeowners would purchase it uh, five and above i think someone would purchase it so all right so what we saw with our visual quality is uh let me explain this graph to you first this is visual quality at the plot level so what i did is i went through and i came up with visual quality for every single grouping of plant species and then i averaged it all together to get one number per plot so uh, with spring of 22, this is three months after planting, the visual quality was about the same. Compost is in red, no compost is in blue, and then our visual quality numbers are on the side here. And four to seven when we averaged it out was what all the plots fell in. And then summer of 22, you can see the no compost uh, visual quality is starting to go down. Fall, maybe things are going down a little bit more in both categories because I think of just fall senescence. And then with spring of 23, they really, visual quality went down in both plots. But you can see the no compost is lower in visual quality than the compost plots. And this was a really hot, dry spring too. And then, but summer 23 bounced back up to about where we started in spring of 22 for the compost. And the no, no compost also improved. So we're seeing this fluctuation because of seasonal impacts. So also what I'm doing is I'm gonna be doing this for every single species. And this is mist flower, and I picked mist flower because it really seems to uh, be very variable depending on the treatments. So I wanted to show you all this. Uh, again, we have compost in red, no compost in blue, visual quality on the y-axis there. And so this is all the seasons. I'm not sure if I'm making that noise or not, but anyway, we're going with it. Um, so. Uh, with this, this is all the seasons combined. We saw that mist flower with no compost. Oh, this is the like the average. You could think of this thick line as like the average that we have. So the average was around four um, visual quality, and then for no compost, and then it was around seven for visual quality with compost. So that's a pretty big difference. Four is not marketable without compost, and then seven is marketable and it's actually pretty nice quality and you saw the difference when we were out there yesterday you all were telling me numbers like oh that one looks like a two that one looks like a four this one looks like a seven this one looks like a nine so we saw a big difference in that species so i'm going to be doing this for all 26 species and not quite sure how long this is going to going to take but down the road i will have this you know in a publishable document that you all could download to see how these species performed all right so what do we find as far as water use goes the as needed Irrigation, um, for 16 months, we put out 15,480 gallons, and that was 107.5 gallons uh, per plot. And then that was 18 applications. Remember yesterday when you're touring the plots, we said we irrigated twice? We irrigated twice, but we irrigated uh, spring of this past year because it was so dry for almost two weeks. 
and we needed to re-wet the soil and the plants were really stressed. I think we could have irrigated actually um, qu quite a bit less actually and still those plants I think would have been all right. But we wanted to make sure that we had you know success uh, with the plant material. And then also we did um, an irrigation this past August where we hit the plots for four days in a row uh, for irrigation just because of the same reason. They were starting to get stressed and droughty. So our as needed saved about 74% water savings by going this route. So again, as needed, we just watered when we saw plants of wilting, stress, signs of stress, and then once a week was once a week. All right, and then just some pictures so you can see the treatment comparison. Sometimes it's hard to see it when you're actually out in the plot. So sometimes it's nice to step back and see, you know, an actual uh, scale wide, I guess you could say, photo. And so on, this is the worst case scenario on um, right over here. This is the worst case scenario for plant stress as needed irrigation without compost. This is the best case scenario for plant stress, which is weekly irrigation with compost. But things start to get interesting when we mix up the treatments here and we have weekly irrigation without compost and as needed irrigation with compost. And we saw this effect for those of you that toured the plots with me yesterday. So the as needed irrigation with compost is performing better than the weekly irrigation without compost. All right, so just some conclusions and next steps. Uh, so far with the stats, we haven't seen any effects um, from the irrigation at the plot level. Our compost has maintained a higher visual quality and we need to dig in and try to figure out why is that? Is it because we improved the density of the soil? Is it because we improved the um, carbon nitrogen ratio or the nutrients in the soil? Or have we increased the water holding capacity? Or have we done all those things with our compost amendments? And then we're, so we need to analyze those soil properties. I've got to get down and do that species specific analysis so that I can give you all tools that you can apply out in the field. And um, we also need to analyze for pest, uh, um, pest presence and disease presence and herbivory. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and I'll turn it over to Michaela. All right, great. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Again, I'm Michaela, master's student at UCF, and I study the pollinators within the plots, so we'll be talking about my research today. Um, so quick outline, we're going to go over brief methods, how do I collect my data. Um, we'll then take a look at the pollinator community, what types of pollinators are we seeing in the plots, and then we'll look into how the different effects of the treatments, compost and irrigation, are they affecting pollinators and how so? Uh, and then we'll look and see what plants were the best pollinator plants over time and how did that change seasonally. We'll also look into some really cool data about the ground dwelling beetles that are being done in the plots by uh, another uh, graduate student at UCF. And then we'll talk about some brief conclusions. So how did I collect my data? Um, I collected data on pollinators and floral abundance three times throughout the year in the spring, summer, and fall. Data collection began in the summer of 2022, and I just finished up my last sampling last month. So we had five rounds of sampling across about a two-year period. Um, so for pollinator observation, I would walk through each of the plots and visually observe the pollinators. Anytime a pollinator landed on an open flower, I would record what type, what species of flower it was, and what species of pollinator it was, as well as the abundance of pollinators within that species. Uh, any pollinator that I didn't know the species of, I would catch it in a sweet net that I had with me and take it back to the lab. Generally, I could ID those uh, down to species level. Um, but at least genus, hopefully. Okay, I would also do flower counts, uh, figure out the floral abundance uh, during each sampling period. So for that, I would count the number of open flowers on all blooming plants. So I wouldn't count any closed buds or dead flowers because I wanted to see what the exact floral abundance was at this specific time. And I would also measure the size of each blooming plant um, to use for some floral estimates. Um, because I had two different counting methods, uh, either total counts or subsampling. So uh, some plants are smaller and have really nice large flowers, uh, like this rosin weed plant up here. Uh, so for that, it's really easy to just count the total number of flowers on that plant. Um, for other plants, plants that have kind of spread throughout the whole plot and become a really big patch or have really tiny flowers, 
it would be kind of not very feasible for me to count all those because one, it would just take forever. And uh, two, it would be really hard to make sure I got a really accurate estimate, a total count of every single small flower. Uh, so in that case, I'd do a subsample count. Um, I had a 25 centimeter quadrat that I would place on top of the plant and count all the flowers within that quadrat. And then I would use the measurements of the plant to figure out the surface area of the plant and take that quadrat and extrapolate it to the entire size of the plant. Um, so moving into some of my preliminary results, looking at the pollinator community, what pollinators are we seeing? So this is from um, our first round of data collection back in the summer of 2022, which was done uh, by Robin, who you might have met in the plots yesterday. Um, and so we found that our greatest uh, abundance, oops, Sorry. Oh, no. What did I do? <laughs> I pressed, I just pressed the next button. You did not. Oh, there we go. Okay, we're back. Good, good. Okay, so our most abundant group of pollinators were our wasps. Um, our flower wasps and other types of wasps were our most abundant group of pollinators. Uh, the next most abundant group we saw were our bees. So uh, our honeybees, our bumblebees, uh, we also saw leaf cutter bees and sweat bees. Uh, then we move into some beetle and other insect bug families. And our least abundant group of pollinators were some of our butterfly groups. Um, we also looked at how uh, pollinator abundance affects pollinator diversity. Um, so we found that as general pollinator abundance increased, uh, the number of species of pollinators or the diversity of pollinators we saw also increased. Um, and this was really well seen in our bee balm, our Monarda. In the fall, it had the highest abundance of pollinators. Um, and it also saw the, the highest number of different species of pollinators as well. So as you get more pollinators, you also get more different species of pollinators. All right, so looking into the effects of different treatments, we're going to talk about effects of compost. So the effects of compost on flowers, we saw a significantly positive impact of compost. So in these composted plots, you're seeing significantly more flowers, sometimes even double the number of flowers compared to those in the non-composted plots. Um, and this significant effect was true for every season, uh, except for spring, we didn't see a significant effect. I think that's just because it was really low floral abundance in general. Um, looking at compost effects on pollinators, we're seeing the same kind of effects, a significant positive effect on pollinators. You're seeing more pollinators in those composted plots, and that again is significant for each season uh, except for spring because there was just not many pollinators out and about. Um, so moving into the effects of irrigation, we have never seen any significant effects of irrigation on either floral abundance or pollinator abundance. Uh, as you can see, generally, there are about the same number on average of flowers and pollinators within the as-needed treatments compared to the regularly irrigated treatments. So irrigation is not having a significant effect, uh, which is really good for water conservation. Um, and then one question that a lot of people probably are wondering are which plants are the best? Which ones draw in the most pollinators? Well, that really changes by season. Season has a big effect on that. So some plants only flower during a specific part of the year. So what is going to be the best pollinator plant changes throughout the year. Um, some of our best pollinator plants in the summer um, was our rattlesnake master that pulled in a lot of plants uh, in both summer of uh, sorry, pollinators, um, in the summer of 2022 as well as the summer of 2023. Um, it was one of our top two pollinator plants in both summer seasons. Um, other great summer plants were rosinweed as well as the frog fruit plant. Uh, moving into fall, our uh, bee balm, our monarda, was definitely our biggest pollinator attracting plant. And overall, I think across all seasons, it had the highest number of pollinators that it attracted overall. Um, and then porterweed was the uh, second highest for the fall. In spring, as you can see, again, really low pollinator abundance in general. Um, but the two best uh, pollinator attracting plants in the spring uh, was our sunshine mimosa as well as twin flower. I um, also want to briefly talk about some really cool data that's being collected um, on the arthropod community, so beetles and other ground-dwelling insects and other creatures like that. Uh, this is being done by Alessandra. She's a PhD student at, the UC at UCF, and she's collecting some really cool data. Uh, you probably saw her pitfall traps in the plots when you were there. Uh, it's a little cup she sets in the ground, and then the beetles and other arthropods will fall into that, and she can see what kind of um, ground-dwelling 
creatures are within the plots. Um, so in the fall of 2022, uh, she found that ants were made up the majority of the arthropod community, making up 66% of the total. And in the fall, uh, compost had a significantly positive impact on arthropod abundance as well as uh, general beetle family abundance. Uh, in the spring of 2023, again, ants were the most abundant group of uh, arthropods, making up 83% of the total. And uh, in the spring, irrigation had a significant uh, effect on um, the general arthropod abundance. Then in the summer, uh, beetles uh, made up the most of the arthropod community. They made up 58%. And out of all the beetles, um, the ambrosia beetle was the most abundant beetle. It made up 60% of all beetles. And in the summer, there was no effects, no significant significant effects of the treatments. Um, so Alessandra has about another year of data collection she's going to do. So we're really excited to see what findings she will end up with. Um, so just some general conclusions to take away from my portion of the talk. Compost is really beneficial to plants and pollinators. When you put compost in the soil, you get more plants, more, fl more flowers, and more pollinators. Um, native plants can do well with minimal irrigation. Um, so this is really good for water conservation because if, uh, even when you use less irrigation, you still get on average just as many flowers and just as many pollinators. Um, and then plant diversity really helps increase pollinator diversity. So by adding in more species of uh, native plants that bloom at different times of the year, you provide a more consistent source of flowers for pollinators and you can draw more pollinators in. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Brooke. I mean, Victoria. Victoria. That's okay. Down forward, right? Down forward. Okay. All right. Everyone. Um, so, uh, as urban development um, and uh, construction continues to expand um, in general, but particularly in Florida, uh, native plants have been really floated as this solution to um, supporting biodiversity. Um, in urban areas, um, but uh, the how that happens or if that happens is still kind of unclear. Um, there's a, a knowledge gap there. Um, so my research focuses on um, if those different landscaping styles are actually supporting um, biodiversity and in general the the organisms that that live around us. Um, so there are many metrics for actually uh, assessing biodiversity. So there's just you know a potential numbers game. So counting um, how many organisms you find in an area. So on like a taxonomic basis. But there's also something called uh, functional groups or functional diversity. So not just like are we recruiting um, you know life into these neighborhoods. Like what functions do they actually? Play. Um, so a functional group is just a group of organisms that have a specific function um, in that ecosystem. So think your herbivores, uh, your predators, pollinators, um, decomposers. So they play these important roles in our ecosystems that are actually necessary to support um, you know, the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so as, as Dr. Bowen mentioned, um, in these you know, recent development sites with that high level of disturbance, higher trophic levels such as birds are going to take a while to actually respond. Um, however, arthropods actually respond to that disturbance level pretty quickly. Um, so we wanted to use arthropod functional groups um, and arthropods in general as a metric for, um, as a model for understanding these ecosystems and how the different landscaping styles might affect them. So um, to do that, there are two different um, hypotheses that I'm mainly testing. So one is, um, as I said, those functional groups. So determining sort of the proportion of those functional groups, how many predators are um, in these landscapes, how many herbivores in the, are in these landscapes, what functions are the ar arthropods actually uh, performing, um, as well as arthropods as a resource themselves. So not just how are these insects using the landscape, but are they actually providing a resource for those higher trophic levels, such as birds? So is how much um, bird food are there in these, in these landscapes? Um, so we're actually doing biomass uh, estimates of those. And my hypotheses were that um, yards that use native plants would confer overall greater resources for higher trophic levels on those two metrics. Um, and actually uh, potentially indicate um, higher levels of food web stability. 
um, if we were to restore those functional groups. Um, so we've gone over the neighborhoods a little bit. Um, everyone saw Westland Park yesterday. I just wanted to put a picture up to just visually compare and contrast these landscapes. Um, so when you look at them visually, they're pretty similar, right? So we know things like um, plant structure, vegetation cover, ground cover, all have um, effects on arthropod communities. Um, so if you were to compare Westland Park to a natural area, that's not really a fair comparison considering the plant structure is so different. Um, and also the successional stage is really different. Um, we do have Del Webb, which is right across the street. So that's more conventional landscaping. And as you can see, the, the plant structure and composition are pretty uh, similar, other than the fact that the Westland Park uh, landscapes are dominated um, primarily by native plants rather than those, those turf grass covers. Also, what makes this a good research site is their proximity to one another. Um, so for an observational study, something that's not highly controlled in a lab, right, we have a lot of different variables that we're working with. Um, one of those is uh, the effect of disturbance on these sites. So when you have a major disturbance, um, like Brooke was talking about, when you completely clear that landscape, you're essentially reassembling an entire community from scratch, right? Um, so the age of the disturbance that happened is really important. And since these communities are similar ages, we can actually compare them um, and compare that reassemblage of communities. Um, the, we also have the ability to have the same uh, type of weather events and climate in these places. Um, they're also right across the street, so that makes it really easy for me to sample. <laughs> um, so how do I sample? Um, I got to show some of you yesterday our setups, but to delve further into that, we have two sticky card and pitfall traps um, in the front yards and the backyards of all these homes. We've got 11 homes in Westland Park um, and 14 in Del, in Del Webb. Um, and we wanted to account for different uh, vegetation and ground cover. So in Del Webb especially, there's, there's turf grass, but then there's those ornamental beds. So we made sure to account for those uh, different types of cover. So what are we finding? That was the big question. And that's like the really exciting question, right? So I wanted to kind of show um, and tell at the same time um, what we're finding. So these were taken. Um, by our technician, Gabby, and they're in the, the lab. Um, as you can see, these are really tiny creatures. Um, and I would love to hear from entomologists, or non-entomologists, sorry, what you think these, these guys are, um, <laughs> how many of them you can identify, because um, I find that really interesting. Um, it also shows us the different types of diversity. So there's a lot of morphological diversity here. There's also um, there's three different orders of insect. Um, we've got. Uh, six different families. Uh, we have three different functional groups present here. We have a spider. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways to actually measure the, that diversity. And it's fun. <laughs> um, so for our preliminary results, um, just on a pure taxonomic basis of a pure taxonomic metric of diversity, um, we're actually not seeing a huge difference. So this data is um, the aggregate of the the number of families found um, in each of the sites. So that's at the treatment level, not necessarily the lot level. So one being Del Webb, one being Westland Park. And when you combine all the families that you found at each of those uh, sites, there's actually not a huge difference. So um, there could be a number of reasons for this. Uh, we are studying a really early successional stage. So like I said, that di disturbance happened uh, really recently. Um, so we may be seeing um, just the, the disturbance as a driver of this. Um, they're also, we're not analyzed, or we haven't analyzed um, those different metrics of diversity at like functional diversity. So you may be seeing a lot of different families of herbivores potentially, or you might be seeing a lot of predators or parasitoids. Um, we don't have that analysis yet. Um, what we do have, so we're finding a lot of things that are actually pretty indicative of urban environments. So this is not surprising data, but it does support um, the impact that the disturbance and the urbanization actually have had on these ecosystems um, before potentially or as these uh, native plant landscapes are establishing. Um, we're finding a lot of ants. We're finding a lot of springtails, so columbola. Um, and if you don't know what those look like, I don't blame you. <laughs> That's why I have these pictures here. Um, we all know what ants look like, so uh, especially after yesterday. Um, but we are finding huge amounts of those, um, and that's, that's concurrent with Alessandra's data in the, the boundary plantings as well. 
So some of the challenges that we've dealt with um, have been uh, or are primarily with the analysis. Um, so we have issues with uh, potentially pseudo replication. So when you do a study like this, when you design it, uh, the statistical assumption is that these sites have been randomly selected, right? This is not a random site. This is an observational study. So we do have um, analytical challenges with that. There have also been changes in landscapes um, as this has progressed. Uh, as I said, this is not a highly controlled lab experiment, um, but I wanted to highlight just how unique um, this site is to study earlier. Um, so we have a lot of uh, you know, challenges, but also um, interesting data coming out of this. So there's also no reference ecosystem. So if you think about it in the, in the context of restoration ecology, you might want to uh, come up with an ecosystem or functional uh, groups that you're trying to restore. We don't necessarily have that. So it's a little bit difficult to gauge uh, how this is gonna develop over time. What are we actually aiming for? There's a lot of different metrics of success in this scenario. Um, we're just producing the, the data here, um, but uh, it is hard to understand if we're trying to come from a restoration angle, how this actually may develop. Um, and then the final one is, is temporal variation. So how is this going to change over time? Um, we know that uh, these are going to eventually um, establish just over the sampling periods that I've had in the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, we've seen huge changes in actual plant establishment. Um, so it would be interesting to see where these landscapes are 10, 20 years from now. I don't have time for that in my degree, but it would be really cool to know. <laughs> um, but we are really framing it in this early, early establishment context, and I think those data are really interesting. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over. Thank you. Okay. Um, well. I'm going to talk about the most straightforward part of, of all of the science that's going to happen um, with, with Sunbridge and Westland Park. I'm going to talk about water use. It's pretty straightforward. We're using billing data. So I work with H2O Save. We work in uh, parts all across the state. You can see them in red, except for Jacksonville got shifted off out into the Gulf Stream. So <laughs> that's, that's actually supposed to be right over Duval County in Jacksonville. Um, but we're in that central portion, Central Florida Water Initiative area, right in the middle around Orlando. Um, so we work with utility data. We match that with property appraisal data so that we can make some apples to apples comparisons on how we're using water and, and how that compares. So um, this is just a, 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 a slide of, of one of our tools that we use. And I'm going to show that one in just a second. OK, hey, we're going backwards now. I've got the, the wrong buttons. Down arrow, yeah. Down arrow. There we go. Now we're getting to the right one. Here's this, this is an overlay graph of a couple of different things. So it's average daily water use by year built for single family detached homes. This is in Gainesville, Florida. If you notice on the x axis, this is grouped by five year periods from 1920 all the way up uh, to 2020. Um, on the left hand vertical axis, we have that average water use, and that's the blue bars. So if you notice from 1920 to about 1985, they're going to hover from 125 gallons per day, 150 gallons per day. It's pretty steady. Uh, that's regular water use. And then around 1985, 1990, we start to see that water use increase drastically, and it keeps increasing. And so now I'm going to talk about that, that orange line. That is the right-hand uh, vertical axis, and that's the percentage of those homes that have permanent in-ground irrigation systems. And you notice from 1920 to, again, about that 1985, it's very low. Those are all retrofits, but very few of those older homes got in-ground irrigation systems as a retrofit. But then right in that area, 1985 or so, we started to make that a regular part of our construction practice. And there's a lot of reasons for that. It's the way we develop. There's uh, rules and regulations with stormwater. There's a lot of reasons why we did that. But as that became a permanent fixture and a regular fixture in more and more homes, we start to see that water use increase. So my job is to help people conserve water. So this is the a major focus, is getting away from these permanent in-ground irrigation systems. And we've seen a lot of people, we've seen a lot of technology. We're trying to, as Pierce would say, we're trying to uh, bank the turn. When we're going too fast, instead of slowing down, we're trying to bank the turn and put technology, make technology in charge of how we reduce this. But we already know, we built houses in Florida for uh, you know, 100 years. And Gail Hansen, she showed a picture uh, of, you know, a home built in 1920 and a home built in 2020, and they look 
very similar, almost identical. The home looks the same. The landscape looks the same. One major difference is one has a permanent in-ground irrigation system and one doesn't. So we know we can do it. It's not, a, it's not a, this is not rocket science that we're going after here. It's just a change back, maybe just rolling back the clock, back to the way we used to do landscapes, maybe as a, as a, a, a in terms of water use, as a, maybe a, a, a step forward, as it were. Um, so what we're doing, uh, we're trying to help people understand the quantity of water used. This is one way to put it in perspective. So there's 623 gallons per thousand square foot if you put an inch of water. So when you look across, we've looked at you know, roughly a million homes across Florida. The average irrigable area is a little over 3,000 square feet, almost 3,200. I think someone yesterday said 3,500. We're right in that ballpark. So if you put a half an inch of water on that, just one irrigation cycle, that's almost 1,000 gallons of water, 991 gallons. And we want to, as extension, we want to put that in perspective for the homeowner. That's like standing in the shower for eight hours and 15 minutes. That's how, much, that's how long you would have to stand in the shower to use that much water. And so when people come to me and like, what about those nice new shower heads? Or should we spend, the, what if we take shorter showers? Does not matter if you're irrigating your yard. It's just, a, it's just a secondary factor. It's wonderful to do. We're still saving that water. But the real savings is with the landscape irrigation. So um, now I'm going to bring this back to Sunbridge and what we're doing here. Um, we all went out to Westland Park. Here's one of our tools. We're going to be bringing online to help people understand the water use, and especially uh, folks who are, who are working here and working with the homes. Uh, this bottom portion, let's see the pointer, this portion, that's the Dell Webb portion of Sunbridge. This is Westland Park. That's where we were standing in the common area yesterday. It's a new portion of, of, of Westland Park. So all of those, those are the individual lots, and we are tracking the water use for each one of those. And the importance of that is to help us understand when we have higher water use than we're expecting. Uh, so here's just one of those homes. This is average daily gallons for just this, this one property. Uh, on the y-axis, that average gallons per day, and just those bars are just through time. So this is March, and you notice that we're up at about 1,100 gallons per day. That's a ton of water. That's a, that's a lot of water. And so that gets stepped down, and then in um, April, we're down around 750. In May, we're back up around 800. And we start to look at this, and we're, we're bringing it down. Uh, I don't see Jimmy in the crowd. I know he's here, but uh, Jimmy Rogers working on that. There he is in the back. He is working on it uh, and really looking at this data and, and trying to step it back. And he's actually been out reading the meters, looking at the meters before and after irrigation events and, and calculating some of these, uh, some of the water use. But then in August, we're getting down to below 200. So go back to that, that graph I showed before, that 150 gallons per day. That was total use for the whole household. Now we're getting down. The landscape is using as much as the, as the, as the total house would. We're looking forward to driving this down to virtually zero. That's where we're going. That's, that's the goal of this whole thing. That's the goal of using these, these different landscape plants, this different landscape style, is to drive the outdoor water use down to zero. And I think, uh, you know, Pierce was talking about it, lots of people talking about it. The build out of this is, you know, between 25 and 30,000 houses. We can't have 200 gallons per day and continue that build out. It's just not, it's just not feasible. We don't have the water for that. And so, again, my role in this is tracking this water use. And that, again, when I look at all the research that's going on, this is the very easy and straightforward part. They're metering water use every month. That's standard part of the billing cycle. We work with Toho Water Authority, who is going to be taking this over right now. It's done by U.S. Water. It's going to be a more seamless process because we work with them every day. And they even have some short interval data so we could go in and look at this um, on a much more fine, uh, much more granular scale. So with that, that's about all I have. And I'm going to turn this over to, to Dell. Well, it's great to be here. <clears throat> this is a, I'm kind of new to this group, but one <clears throat> a lot of interesting things have been discuss discussed, but the real question is, we do all of this, what does it mean to water quality leaving the property? And that's what 
I'm looking at, and Pierce and I have talked about this for years, and it's great that this program is developed to where now we're going to get information to where we can actually quantify the extent of how much of an impact will these have, these types of programs. So I'm, I'm going to compare some water quality impacts of residential landscapes using the WAM model. So just to kind of tell you what the WAM model is, it's a comprehensive watershed model. And if I can actually point here, it actually puts a grid over the entire watershed. And within that grid, it goes into great detail of what's going on. What is the landscape? What's the irrigation practices? What kind of crops are being grown and everything? And so that's being done down in each one of these grids. We normally do about a hectare grid on a watershed. In this study, we're doing a one square meter grid. So we're really fine down, so we've got details within the yard and that sort of thing. So it simulates that, and then it routes that water from every individual point within the watershed to the streams. And it can handle all kinds of complex stream systems. I, of course, that's been my life. I'd like to spend an hour on that this part, but let's get into the actual application of it. And what we... This is what we've used the model thus far. Major focus has been down here in the Okeechobee Basin. We've actually uh, have simulated the uh, Del Webb Sunbridge area a couple of times over the past 15 years, but never in the detail. We've never had the level of data that we currently have now. But this is the type of data, and I would like to say this is, we just got a contract to fill in this gap right here so that's that's great that we're able to actually use the model to assess particular practices we always refer to them as BMPs now let's jump to Dell Webb here's a visual picture of it and what we wanted to do to model this to try to model the whole thing we decided to go in and select a basin within it to which we can define exactly what's happening within that area. You kind of jump up and look at that. You can see, and this picture is a little old. It's fully developed out by now. And so it's got one big retention pond right here in the middle, which drains over to here, goes through this retention pond, and drains out into the native area here, the wetlands over to the right here. The stormwater system that's put in you to simulate what's happening within there to understand how water moves and collects. We had to actually put in the stormwater system, which Del Webb, through their construction, has very detailed. We know exactly what's out there, which is great from a modeling standpoint. And so every one of the stormwater drains are shown here where the water goes into the curves and all of that. One thing that isn't quite fully known is what happens to the groundwater. The surface water is very defined. It goes to the stormwater system. The groundwater is going to go drain, and most of it's going to drain to the pond. That's what these are over here is to show groundwater. And we know, looking at it, that probably areas along here, the actual groundwater that's seeping out is going to leave and not go to the retention basins. Over here we have some leaving, but some of this will probably go into these retention basins. And this just shows the details of which stormwater systems are collecting water within the system. So this is the land use that we break up in order to simulate because like I mentioned, we have a square meter, and so we have to tell the model where what land use is occurring within there. We simplified it here. We've got the, the managed landscape is around the ponds and around the road areas, common areas. Then we have medium density residential are the home lots. Then we have the open water, and then we have roads, transportation, borders. We actually went in to look at this in a little bit more detail. We actually have, you know, the home. So 
the thing we have to know within the medium density residential is how much is roofs and driveways and sidewalks and how much is actually landscape. So we have to break all of that out in great detail. So just as a, just this is very beginning. We're doing this. We don't have a. We're going to collect a lot of data in order to verify the model. But the beauty of this is you can go in and play what if games. What if we stopped irrigation? What if we modified how we irrigate? What if we changed the landscape types? You know. So you can play what if games, and the computer's a lot cheaper to run that scenario than going out and planning. 20 homes and trying to do all that. But ultimately, you've got to go out and do the homes to get the real data to know that this is real or not. So I did a number of scenarios here, uh, BMPs, couple base conditions. Basically, where we have fertilization three times a year, we're applying uh, some, this has got reclaimed water going on, and then we've got irrigation going on with certain irrigation controls. How often do we irrigate? And reclaim water is going to go on on a more steady basis, so much per week or whatever, where irrigation control and comparing what if you put it on based upon moisture conditions versus just putting it on weekly, how much of an impact that's going to have. So anyway, we looked at a lot of these scenarios, and we can't get into them all. And I want to emphasize this is not calibrated yet, so when you look at this don't take any numbers away from some of the uh, results here. But I think it hopefully will give you a little bit of a perspective of what we can actually do with a model. Well, first thing, we can generate a lot of data that you can't understand. <laughs> so this is all those different conditions potted up on one plot. Well, that's, that's impossible to actually re review. And that was runoff, and this is groundwater. You can see there's a brown line that's pretty low. That's the non-reclaimed water conditions. The reclaimed water really increases groundwater discharge. But if you look at a cumulative flow over time, it separates out the impacts of them. And just a couple of takeaways from this that Here's how much runoff this is accumulating over time. About 36 inches a year would be this, and that's a lot of discharge. That's, that's the very high reclaimed water, 50 inches a year type application rate. And then you come down where you stop reuse water and you look at different irrigation. But the one thing you'll notice that all the runoff is much higher. This is what was coming off the land before we did the development. And the primary thing that's causing the, oops, causing the increase is actually the impervious surfaces. It's the roofs, it's the driveways, it's the roads. And we actually gain a lot of water. And that's the thing that needs to get worked out that we haven't done a good job. We're worried about depleting water use through the home use, but we actually generate a lot of water in these watersheds, in these developments. And if we could take that water and collect it and put it back up where we're getting our water supply, we wouldn't have a water problem. The problem is we don't do that. The runoff runs off, goes into the ocean, goes to Lake Okeechobee, somewhere else. Groundwater also is increased. Native groundwater, these soils really didn't have any groundwater flow prior to development. Now they're built up. There's going to be some groundwater seeping. It doesn't go to deep aquifers it eventually flow off to the sides of the development. This is, this is a surface water con concentrations. Actually, the, the concentrations don't go much above native conditions for runoff. That's mainly because you got all the surface water and it's just rainwater pouring into your retention ponds. Groundwater is a different issue. It, you're really going to have, you're going to see very large concentration increases in groundwater. And again, you can separate that out. And again, you can look at the, the relative impacts of here we're looking at nitrogen. And, you know, and obviously, because we've got so much more runoff, even though the concentration hasn't increased, 
because we have more runoff, we have more load leaving. Pardon? Total nitrogen. And so, oops. phosphorus is a little different, a little, a little messier. And this is in the Okeechobee Basin, and everybody's very concerned about phosphorus in the Okeechobee Basin. So that's that is a focus. Again, concentrations. If you actually look at the concentrations of phosphorus, they're very low, relatively speaking. In groundwater, in surface water, they do peak up. So when you look at the accumulative phosphorus in runoff, and runoff is going to make it Lake Okeechobee, and Lake Okeechobee is a focus of concern that under reclaimed water and fertilization practices, you're going to have significant amount of phosphorus going into leaving the site. Just some basic con conclusions. And I, I need to make sure that uh, it's understood when I'm referring to runoff and groundwater discharges are increasing. That's, I think that's straightforward. Reclaimed wastewater application simply significantly increases runoff and nutrient losses. And I was, <laughs> Richard last night pointed out losses. Make sure you understand what I'm really referring to there, how many nutrients are leaving the property. You know, loss, it's, it may not be as understandable what that's referring to, but it's really what's leaving the property. So there will be with reclaimed water because reclaimed water is just like you're getting another 25 inches of rainfall. So you're going to just get more runoff and it's going to take more with it. So it's pretty straightforward, I think. Fertilizer applications, again, if there's more nutrients in the soil and you're leaching the soil, you're going to get more losses. So it's pretty straightforward. The one thing that's interesting is you're going to get more of the fertilizer loss when you're doing reclaimed water because you're wetting the soil. It's going to go through more often. Where if you're just irrigating a normal irrigation schedule and fertilizing, you won't lose nearly as much as the fertilizer. So it gets tricky. And that's what the model is for, is to show the relationships of doing different practices and what quantitatively, what kind of impact you're going to end up with that. Now, obviously, groundwater losses, you could see you're going to get high nitrates and stuff coming out of the groundwater, but in this particular location, most of that's going to be nitrate. By the time you drop back down through that organic spodosol that was underneath there and go out into a wetland, most of those are going to get denitrified and assimilated. So nitrogen going downstream may not be as big of an issue as it's leaving the property because of those processes. So that's, you know, I just want to give you a quick overview of the tool, what we're going to look towards in the future. You know, we're just waiting to get the data to go in and refine the algorithms in this to make sure that we're actually treating it, it you know, in, as reality out there. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Basil Iannone. I'm an associate professor at the University of Florida. I had the pleasure of working with all these wonderful people up here and everyone in the group back there. Um, so I'm here to moderate for questions. So uh, it, it, I'm opening up the floor for questions currently. And does that mean I have four minutes? OK. Uh, <laughs> so does that, I'm going to. You know, I have questions for this group that I can discuss with them later on. Uh, but for everyone out there, who's got a burning question they want to ask? Let's... Speaking of burning, um, I had a question when you were clearing, and I'm sorry, it's the second lady on, on the right there for you. When they were burning the um, 
um, the existing landscape. Is there a way, um, or at least a study, of turning that into compost rather than rather than burning and releasing the carbon in the air? I mean, it, I think it could be a possibility, but it is uh, widely so different than what we currently do during the development process. I mean, it's a, it would be a massive amount of plant material. I think it could possibly be, you know, uh, an opportunity, but, and it kind of gets beyond me. I, I don't, you know, I'm more of a, or, a ornamental horticulturalist and, and don't know the development process real intensively, but yeah. Potent yeah. Other questions? I think, sorry, one behind you had their hand up first, yeah. They're going to come with a microphone. Or you can just say it, and I'll repeat the question for everybody. That could be there we quicker. Go. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you. When looking at the um, increasing population and diversity in these new landscapes, I'm wondering if there is a possibility of looking at the surrounding native areas, if there are increasing populations, like uh, are we concentrating species in those areas while we're waiting for recovery in the developed areas. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, are those species moving out into those other areas? So if we looked at those areas and compared them pre and post development, would those natural areas now have heavier concentrations or greater populations of species? Where do they go? Or do they just all die? Sounds like a question for Patrick, actually. Well, we do have, uh, we'll know a little bit about that because Alessandra, who's doing the pitfall traps, is also doing them in Split Oak Preserve, which is a very good native ecosystem, uh, very close by. But we do know what we're observing um, uh, is being drawn from the natural areas. Uh, some of the species we see are species uh, like the American bumblebee. We'd expect it to be near some native natural areas. So there's that phenomenon happening. And then it really depends on the nature of that natural system that you're comparing it to as well. But we also know that what we're going to draw into the neighborhoods is coming from those areas. So for an example like Del Webb, which for pollinators seemed very depauperate or had very few numbers, we think if we put the flowers there that they came to, they would come because they're surrounded by the same, the same lands that are probably the source populations. We also have in the developments uh, seen uh, the introduction of invasive species that would probably be found to a lesser extent in the natural areas. So three of the most abundant beetles we've seen are from Peru and Bolivia and other parts of the world. So you also have those invasive species that come in. I don't know if that fully answers your question or... I, I can yeah. add to it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it, so I think that could be uh, maybe an unintended consequence of planting these native landscapes near these natural areas is that we could have some of these plants that are not necessarily native to this area, to that natural ecosystem, and they could, you know, escape into that ecosystem. I mean, it's still a native plant, but um, again, we're growing in a very non-native environment, like the urban soils, that is not native at all. That is not native soil. And so, um, you know, I think there could be, I th yeah, if, if we plant some of these native plants and it butts up to a natural area, we can have some of these native plants get into an area where they typically wouldn't normal, normally be. So I think it can go both ways. Sorry, we have one quite more question. And some of you, um, sorry. Dell's presentation mentioned that the, there was a very significant runoff from hard surfaces, which were not collected, but runs off into oceans and, and um, downstream, uh, d <coughs> excuse me, um, downstate. Um, <coughs> and you mentioned that we could uh, capture or suggested that there was an opportunity here that we could capture this water and solve a, a significant amount of our water problem by doing so. And I'm wondering what kinds of thought, given the, the situation we find ourselves in on this peninsula, we could envision or engineer for actually starting to capture this water and be able to reuse it. That's you. Well, I appreciate that question. And there, uh, there are things going on. Is, he mic? Is this mic on? Yeah, there are projects going on that are trying to do exactly that. Uh, I notice Mike Register is here from St. John, so they're looking at trying to get some stormwater back up into some of the lakes areas. And the, the whole process is to try to capture it. And you can do some on site. For example, like Raiden Dell Webb, if you were going to irrigate 
why not irrigate out of the ponds instead of from off-site water? And that's the type of thing that needs to be done because you need to get the stormwater back to where you're getting your surface water for your developments. In some areas, it's a lot easier. Unfortunately, most of our developments are right along the coast, and all of the stormwater generated goes right to tide and is lost. But infrastructure can be built. There are examples to where, but it's very expensive to do that. I'm going to say one last question because we have to wrap it up. But uh, for the research team up here, we've got hydrologists, we have a water analytics expert, we have ecologists. Who else is missing here? Who should be giving talks next year? What type of researchers and what sort of questions? Are we all on a mic? Yeah, I'm on a mic. Um, I would say given the transformation we're talking about, uh, has a big social aspect to it, uh, plant acceptability, uh, willingness of uh, buyers to buy, willingness of producers to produce, that you would probably want either a, so, you know, a social scientist or an economist to investigate some of those questions because there's a lot of natural science uh, issues that relate to what we're talking about. But the next uh, horizon, really, frontier would be a look at the social science aspects, which I think are uh, very important when we talk about adoption on a wider scale. And there are other examples from around the country that could be used as a comparison. Thank you. Do we have to move on now? Yeah. Any other ideas? Good answer. Yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a plug. Okay. So thank you. <laughs>